The Overwhelmed Brain is a proud member of the Healing Broadcast Network, where coaches, counselors, and healers thrive. Are you annoyed by affirmations? When someone comes up to you and says, Think positively! Do you say, Hello, do you want a chocolate? I could eat about a million and a half of these. Uh, I, I don't... I, My mama always said the overwhelmed brain is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're gonna get. I, uh, think positively. Those must be comfortable shoes. I bet you could walk all day in shoes like that and not feel a thing. Uh, I gotta go. Hey, you forgot your MP3 player. Hmm. Let's see what's on it. If affirmations feel like lies and positive thinking feels like denial, then get ready to start creating the life you've always wanted. Wow, I like this. Hello, this is Paul Coliani, host of The Overwhelmed Brain, the personal growth show for the critical thinker. On every episode, we'll talk about practical, down-to-earth steps to help you improve your mood and keep you sane in this powerful journey we call life. I want to help you bridge the gap between your emotions and reason, causing you to discover why you do the things you do and what you can do to reach higher levels of happiness and lower levels of stress and overwhelm. My ultimate goal is to help you become empowered so that you can create the life you want. All right, before we start today's show, I have to mention that this is an edit. This is an insertion. This is me having a fully produced show and then coming back to the recording of that show and adding something before I uh, let you hear the rest of the recording. So why am I doing this? Well, this show is supposed to be segmented as all the other new episodes have been. However, uh, the subject matter was so important that I decided to extend it into a full episode about the dirty divorce or the long dirty divorce or however you want to say it. When you go through a divorce, it's tough. There's a lot of stuff that happens, a lot of emotions that happen. And this show derived from an email that I got from someone who was just awfully depressed because of her long, dirty divorce. It's my words, not hers, but she is experiencing a really bad situation. So I know a lot of us have gone through this or a lot of us are thinking about going through it or hoping that they don't go through it. So I wanted to create an entire episode based on this subject matter. So you won't have the news in you segment or the what am I thinking right now segment. Uh, There might be another one missing because the entire episode is made up of this one subject. So here's my recommendation. If you have any concerns about divorce, listen to this show. If you have already been divorced and are still suffering in any way, still stressed about it in any way, listen to this show. If you're happily married, listen to this show. If you're single and ever considering getting married, listen to this show. I think you know where I'm going with this. There's a lot of information here. The reason I had to insert this little recording before the show began is because it ran over an hour and 10 minutes. And even this insertion is adding even more time. So (laughs) I apologize about that. Lots of info here. I hope you get what you need. Oh, and when I talk about the person who wrote the email, uh, she's a woman. But if you're a man, or no matter who you are, just relate what I'm saying about her in your life. So if I say, I call her Sandy, if I say, hey Sandy, this is what I want you to do, I want you to take it on yourself in case you're going through something similar. You probably already know to do that, but uh, like I said, this show is based around an email I got, so I'm definitely talking to her, and I'm sort of talking to you too. So stick around, the show is about to begin with today's quote. Today's quote is by Wayne Dyer, and it's this. Conflict cannot survive without your participation. What I really enjoy about this quote is that 
conflict is all there is when you have any type of resistance inside of you. Resistance in the sense of whatever you're holding on to that you don't want to let go, any type of attachment, anything that you feel you need to hang on to that causes you to feel bad. For example, when I was getting divorced, I didn't want to let go of my wife. I didn't want to believe that it was happening. Uh, at the same time, I knew that I had to let it go in order to start the process of growing and healing. And in order to start that, I needed to let things go. But I was in a conflict, and this conflict created resistance inside my body. And when I say that, all I really mean is that whenever you have negative emotions and you feel bad, that is a resistance. That is a conflict. If you feel bad that someone lied to you 10 years ago, and you're still hanging on to the idea or the feeling of betrayal of when that happened, then you're choosing to create your own conflict. You're choosing to hang on to pain. That's really what it comes down to is that when you hang on to any type of resentment or anger or hurt, you are hanging on to the process of self-abuse. Now, I know that's harsh, but think about this for a minute. If you can't forgive someone, if you can't let something go, how are you abusing yourself by continuing to hang on to your resentment, by continuing not to forgive? And listen to my last week's segment on forgiveness. How long will you go holding on to this pain? See, I have a belief system that if you hang on to emotional pain, you are actually going to cause physical illness in your body. And who knows what it can transform into. Hanging on to pain creates physical discomfort. Physical discomfort prolonged turns into physical ailments. Again, this is my own belief system and a lot of other people believe it, but you know, if your doctor says otherwise, <laughs> follow the advice you want to follow. But in my own experience, I held on to anger for I don't know, 30 plus years, anger over my stepfather and how he treated us, how, do, how he treated me and the family. And I didn't know I hated him for so long. And then all this anger came up one day in my 30s and I developed a stomach problems. I developed acid indigestion. I It felt like there was a hole in my stomach and I couldn't eat uh, spicy foods or anything that would upset anything acidic really that would upset my stomach because suddenly my stomach lining was just too weak it wasn't didn't have any defenses and i later connected the dots and found out that all of my anger caused my stomach problems so i went through probably two or three years of expressing everything i hated everything i was angry about and just kept expressing it to someone I trusted. And at that time, it was my wife. And she listened without giving her opinions or judgments. She just listened. She created that safe zone I talk about. When someone's there to create that safe zone that you can just talk and express all your hurt and your pain, then it comes out. It gets expressed. All that internal conflict and resistance gets expressed. And it needs to. That conflict inside of you. Anything that you're hanging on to needs to be expressed because it's building like a pressure cooker. And it, in my opinion, creates physical problems. But as soon as I let a lot of that go, my stomach problems started to go away. I started getting, I hate to say it, better smelling breath. My breath was so bad because I had all these stomach problems. I don't know what your situation, if you have any physical ailments, that might be related to your emotional state. Think about the emotions that you have going on inside of you. What negativity are you holding on to? And how is that manifesting in your body? And what can you do to express this repressed emotion, 
what can you do to let these emotions come out in a way where you can either verbalize it or write them down? We're going to talk about this a little bit uh, later in the episode because I have an email from someone who's going through quite a painful experience and she really isn't in a good place. So I'm going to read that to you in the next segment. But remember what Wayne Dyer said, conflict cannot survive without your participation. That means you are accountable for at least part of the conflict inside of you. Sure, there may be people in your life that are causing you conflict now. I know people that know people that are causing them conflict. And, you know, I'm directly related to some of these people and they cannot get out from under this conflict, it seems. But some of them are holding on to their own belief systems and how things should work. And so conflict continues to be persistent in their life. And I'm here to tell you, if you hang on to something that doesn't work, if you hang on to something that doesn't serve you, you continue to allow the conflict, to allow that resistance that builds up inside of you and all that negativity, you continue to allow it to exist. We'll get into belief systems and how you feel about things and how you feel about life in general and and how you can get a generally satisfying and peaceful life if you learn to let go of some of the attachments in your life. It took a massive breakdown for me to let go of attachments, to learn how to be happy being broke, how to be happy being single. How to be happy even when no one is there to love me, at least romantically. And you shouldn't have to have this breakdown. Sometimes you have to just to get the lesson. And if you're ready for it, just ask for it. It'll come. (laughs) That's what I did when I let go of all my attachments. Like a day or two before that happened, I asked for a mystical experience. I've told this on the show before. And my mystical experience came in the form of losing all my possessions and being stranded in the desert, pretty much, in Arizona. And that opened my eyes, it opened my heart, and it it allowed me to let go of my anxiety and my panic. And once I was able to let go of all that stuff, I was free. I was free from all the attachments that used to stress me out. Now, it doesn't mean I'm completely free of stress and anxiety from that point on, but most of it is gone. And when there is some sort of threat that I feel to my system, whether it's a financial threat, like, oh no, I'm not going to be able to pay this bill or any other type of threat, like, oh no, my girlfriend might leave me or whatever comes up. I'm in a place where I can handle it better because I've let go of so much. So there's a lot in Wayne Dyer's statement. He's right. Conflict can't survive without you being a part of it. You are there to either hang on to what is hurting you and making you feel bad or let it go to clear a path to happiness, to get you into a situation where at least you can feel some peace. Because that's what a lot of us want. We just want to get out of the muck and mire and feel some peace. We don't even want to feel, I don't want to be happy. I just want to feel some peace because we know that peace brings happiness. Bring Peace brings joy. This may not be your story, but it's my story. I know that when I am able to let go of a lot of the stresses in life, then life just becomes easier. It becomes more peaceful and happiness exists as a result. Like I said in my book, Clear the Path to Happiness, do not pursue happiness. Instead, work on clearing all the negativity that you're hanging on to in your life. And the path will be clear and happiness will just arrive. That's my wish for you. Let's go on to our next segment called Ask Paul. All right, I want to tell you about a service that has saved my girlfriend, quite literally, 
thousands of dollars. And it's legal shield. Now, imagine being able to have an attorney send someone a letter on your behalf, on their letterhead. A phone call or a letter like that has a lot of power and authority behind it. Now, whether you want an attorney to take care of a parking ticket or just need to ask a legal question really quick, head over to getoutofthemess.com. For less than $20 a month, you can have access to legal representation. That is phenomenal. So visit getoutofthemess.com to learn more. Know that I use this incredible service. My family uses it, and I highly recommend it. All right, this next segment is called Ask Paul. And I get your emails almost daily, so I want to thank you for sending me your questions, sending me your comments. I get a lot of feedback about the show. I'm so grateful that you take the time to write and give feedback. It just, it makes me feel good, and I keep every one of your letters. So I want to let you know if you have written and you're waiting for me to respond, I have it in my inbox. It's sitting there. It's waiting for me to reread it because I've already read them all at least once and respond to you in a way that's meaningful. So again, feel free to write anytime, whether it's criticism, comments, or questions, whatever you want to say, I'm always available. So here's today's email. Dear Paul, I just found some of your articles today. Where have you been these last five years? <laughs> I feel lost. Lots of hopeful things that have just gone by the wayside during this long divorce. I've been dealing with this for years and I'm scared to death. I feel overwhelmed all the time having to start over as a single woman. And all of this just seems futile and not worth the effort. I have all the responsibilities instead of just half now. I've lost my desire and nothing is driving me to be, quote, all I can be. Things I do seem futile. I'm disappointed in myself and I don't feel like the adult I used to be. I'm just trying to accept my divorce at this late stage of my life. My ex-husband left me for someone else just as we were planning our next phase of life. The divorce surprised me and it didn't go in my favor. He chose not to give me any help financially, and I'm having to start completely over. I'm deeply depressed, and I'm not working. My brain is so scattered, and I miss the routines and structure and security marriage gave me. I have to care for a member of my family, and I can't find employment, and the only jobs that I've been close to getting are simple part-time, low-wage jobs. I've held higher positions in the past, and I've made enough to support myself. I go to counseling, but it's not helping much. I hate this new life, and I'm bored with myself and my responsibilities, and I have no desires or interests anymore. I allowed the divorce and his betrayal to destroy me and my self-esteem and my self-confidence. I am now uninteresting and have no motivation. It drains me to socialize. Just having a shower or washing my hair or cleaning up the dishes overwhelms me and causes anxiety and negative emotions. He still owes me money, but he knows that I can't afford to hire an attorney again to get it from him. I'm embarrassed it turned out this way, and especially that I have turned out this way. What words of wisdom do you have? I need a miracle from your experience and knowledge of survival. I realize that I am in victim mode. I'm afraid of the extra responsibility of what life will be like if I just move on. It just seems like too much for me to handle in the state that I'm in. Does any of this make sense or do I just sound like a whiner? I pray for a better life and I've tried to let it go and give it to God, but I'm just not there. Can you help? This is from a person I'm going to call Sandy. It's not her real name. Well, Sandy. Thank you for sharing this. This was a powerful letter. I can feel your emotion as I read it. And the first thing I'd like to say is probably something maybe you're not used to hearing when you tell this story is, congratulations, you dodged a bullet. <laughs> I'm serious. The deception, the betrayal could have gone on for many, many more years. That would put you in the permanent place of sucker. You don't want to be a sucker. You learned about the betrayal and now you're out of that situation. 
so you're no longer being deceived. Of course, he may be lying and taking you to court and doing other things, but you're not deceived in the, in what I call emotional murder. Now, that's a strong term, but when someone is cheating on you in your relationship, it's like they're committing emotional murder. When you can get out of that situation, you are free of that crime. You are free of someone deceiving you, putting you in harm's way by having, quite frankly, sex with other people because he's bringing home whatever he's catching from those people. Hopefully not, but it can and does happen. So yes, congratulations for getting out of that situation. I know it's hard. I know it. Your situation may look and feel terrible right now, but just imagine if it had gone on. Imagine if you stayed and that was continuing. You know your instincts and your flags were being raised. You know things were happening when you were married that maybe you were denying. So imagine being in the situation where you kept feeling that way and it got worse and worse and worse. If it wasn't discovered, you would not be happy anyway. Now, what I didn't get from your letter was, did you catch him and force him to cough it up and admit, or did he come to you and admit it? The reason I ask this is because there's a difference on the character of someone after they approach you and admit what they were doing. And it's the character that's going to be in place after the admission, did he approach you or did you catch him and you force him to admit it? The difference is if you caught him and you forced him to say, okay, you're right. I did it. You know, so on and so forth. I hate to say this, but he's probably done it before. A lot of cheaters will do this. They will continue as long as they're not getting caught. But when they do get caught, they'll only admit to that one and never before on other ones. So I don't mean to make you depressed because of that, but I do want you to understand the difference between someone who approaches you and says, you know what? I admit it. I've been cheating on you. Here's the person. They're usually more honest, even though they've been dishonest, but their morality caught up to them. Their conscience caught up to them. They know they've been mistreating you. They know they've been treating you badly. So they come to you and admit it. Now, a cheater is still lying to you. If you're in the situation, of course, cheating is all about lying or deceiving your partner so you can be with another person or so they can be with another person. But it would be interesting to know that if he approached you and admitted it, then you separated from there or if you caught him and he was forced to admit it. Either way, you chose to break up, get the divorce and move on with life. However, he is making it hard for you to move on with life. That's a problem. Here's the second thing I want to say to you. Victims don't seek help. They embrace being a victim to secure the attention of others. Now, the reason I say that is because you said, I know I'm being a victim. You're not really being a victim. You are allowed to be a victim, but victims don't seek help. Victims want to stay in their misery. Victims want to stay the victim. It's somehow satisfying in a, a dysfunctional way. When you stay the victim, you get the attention. You can repeat the story over and over and over again to people, and then you get attention. You get some sort of love and significance. You have these feelings that come up when you get people to support you after you tell them the story. And maybe you have done that. Maybe you've told this story over and over again because people want to know this stuff. They want to know what's going on in your life. But you reached out and said, I need help. That's not victim. You're allowed to be a victim for a period of time. You're allowed to feel everything you feel. Just make sure you feel it and don't dismiss what's coming up. All your feelings are valid and should be thought out fully, even if they're against your moral and ethical core. It doesn't mean you act out on those thoughts and feelings. You just validate them. So if you have feelings of hatred, feel that hate. Let it come out. Express it. Don't act upon it because you might do something you regret later, but express it and allow those feelings and emotions to exist. Allow those thoughts to exist. I've had thoughts. I don't think I've ever said this on the air. I've had thoughts that I wanted to kill someone. I really wanted to just, oh, they were so, they made me so angry that I wanted to kill them. And then 
by having those thoughts, allowing those thoughts to come up in me, they immediately dissipated. It's like, whoa, of course I wouldn't kill anyone. That's stupid. But having those actual thoughts come out of me, just even by myself or with someone that I trust to express them to, having those thoughts come out of me released the pressure inside of me. That's what this does. That's what expression does. When you allow thoughts to exist, when you validate those thoughts and allow them to be, they release pressure. It's like that pressure valve on a on a steam cooker. You release that pressure valve and all that pressure comes out. And that's what expressing the deepest thoughts that you have, no matter how immoral or unethical they are, that's what happens. You start releasing that pressure because you're actually manifesting your internal negativity. You're expressing it and expressing it manifests. It pulls it out of your system. It's hard to explain, but you know what I mean. I know you do because when you finally get something off your chest, there's a reason that saying exists and why it's worded that way. I need to get something off my chest because we hold anger and sadness and other negativity in our stomach and our chest and that torso area, that whole midsection of our body. You know we do because as soon as you feel sadness, you feel it in your stomach or you're You feel angry, you feel it in your stomach. That's where I feel anger. Sadness, I usually feel in my chest, near my heart, coincidentally. All this negativity you feel in your body as feelings. So when you're able to express it and get it out of your system, that pressure valve releases and you're able to let go of some of this stuff. It doesn't mean you're letting go of uh, what you need to do next. It just means you're letting go of the emotional energy of what you need to do next. You're letting go of the emotional energy of things from the past of the hurt that you experienced because you can still take action on what you need to take action on, but your forward momentum won't be clouded by your negative emotions, your negative feelings inside of you. It, I know it's, it's going to be hard to get rid of all of them, but what you do is express as much as you can and don't hold back. Don't hinder yourself and think that what you're thinking you shouldn't think. I went too long thinking I shouldn't hate my stepfather. I shouldn't hate him because people aren't supposed to hate. But as soon as I let that hatred come up, that was what released me from hanging on to the hate. And then I no longer hate it. So it's a, it's a very good practice to allow thoughts and feelings to exist so that you can express them. Because once they're identified, they lose their power. And That conflict, as Wayne Dyer was talking about, that conflict inside your body starts to go away. It starts to dissipate. Don't be a participant with the conflict. Let that stuff come up and out of you. There's no polite way to say this, but quite frankly, divorce sucks. (laughs) Feelings are hurt. Assets are lost. Kids are split up into different families and your emotions are torn apart. My divorce was easy, but it was painful. I had no kids and we had no assets to split and I made it as quick as possible. I wanted to end that marriage as quick as possible. I didn't want to end the marriage. But after I knew she was not going to accept anything but divorce, I wanted to make sure the divorce went quick and painlessly. Wasn't painless, but it went quick. I went to the courthouse the next day, got the paperwork. I went online and found a site to handle my divorce papers because I didn't know how to do it. It was so much involved. And within two months, the paperwork had been signed and Things were on their way out and I didn't have to worry about it anymore until a few months later when I finally got the uh, the divorce decree or whatever they call it, the dissolution, I think. It was hard. It was painful. But I also knew that if I held on to what once was, that I would not be able to heal. That's the most important step when you're going through anything is that let's close this loop. Let's close this circuit so that we can start our healing process. My idea is to end the divorce as quickly as possible. When you've tried every other avenue to try to save the marriage and it doesn't work, no matter what, then end it as soon as possible. Just go through the paperwork, sign the papers, get out of that situation. The problem is, 
when one of you goes after the other person for vengeance or something. They'll drag it out and cause their own and your misery. And if you have no choice to stay in the divorce for like you are years because you're being pursued relentlessly, it's not an easy road. I know you've been dealing with this for years, which is years too long when the other person is pursuing and pursuing, wanting to drain the life out of you and the money out of you. It's defeating. What can you do? I know someone who's been to court almost 20 times and she still isn't out of the legal mess of her divorce. That's a tough road. And the person going after being vengeful, there's usually one person who just wants it to end and there's another person who just wants to drag it out to show the other one that they have control and and the other person deserves to suffer. And it's a nightmare. So I understand where you're at. You just want it to end. You want it to move on. But maybe there is a small way you're hanging on to something. And that's what I'm trying to address here. That's that's part of it. Maybe there's something that you are hanging on to, uh, the memory of what once was and you want it back or something like that, that's actually prolonging this for you. Again, it may not be that. Maybe he's just a really, really bad guy and he wants you to suffer for some reason, even though it sounds like he was the one who betrayed you. But some people are strange like that. They are the ones who cheat and they are the ones who lie and deceive and then they get mad when you leave them. It's a really odd thing. I don't I don't know if it's narcissism or what, but it just seems so heartless. And some people can be that way when they want to get what they want. So again, I'm sympathizing with you. I know where you're at. Now, you said that all of this doesn't seem worth it and that you've lost your desire. Now, let me share with you when you're clouded with misery, you make miserable decisions because it feels like you'll never get better. When you're in misery, you compound misery. You prolong misery. You get more misery. Just just the way it works. And the poor, you've heard that saying, the poor get poorer, the rich get richer. There's some truth to that. Now, the contrast is while you were married, it may have felt like a real happiness. But looking back, Was that blissful ignorance? Was that a scam on your heart? I would rather have someone honestly hate me than pretend to love me. I would rather be with no one than be with someone who treats me like garbage by deceiving me and putting me in harm's way by purposely betraying me. I would rather have no love than bad love. And that's a tough one. Because I believe that most of us want love. Most of us want to feel significant. We want to feel wanted. We want to know that we're wanted. We want to know that we're loved. The truth of the matter is we are. We're all wanted. We're all loved. We're all significant. But some people come along and taint our perception of ourselves. We believe them when they say, you're stupid. You're an idiot. You know, whatever the words come out. We start believing that you're incompetent. You can't do this. You're not woman enough. You're not man enough. You don't have the brains. We start believing things that people say for some reason because usually because we trust them. And trust is listening and believing things that people say because we trust them. And when they say things that are hurtful, we tend to believe that too. You got to start considering the source. When hurtful things come out of someone's mouth, It's coming from a hurtful place. It's coming from a hurting place. It's coming from a place of pain and dysfunction in their own life. And it's not true. Because before they said it, you were probably fine. But then someone said it. Maybe they said it in your relationship. Maybe they said it when you were a kid. But before they said it, you were fine. (laughs) So suddenly we start believing these things that people tell us. And they're not true. They, They are not true. They just, they're not true. You just can't believe it. But because we've placed our trust in people, when we were children and we trusted our parents, then they say something like, you're so stupid, don't ever write on the walls again. We take it to heart, we believe it. Yet, it's coming from a place of their pain, of their dysfunction. It comes from a place 
of their maybe anger or hurt in some way, shape, or form. So consider the source. When the source has a problem and tries to project that problem onto you, you're not the problem. They're the problem. They're the dysfunction. We all have dysfunction in some way, but when you start believing the words of a dysfunctional person, especially when they're deprecating towards you, you start believing that you are less than who you already were. And that amplifies what you already believe about yourself. So if you go into a relationship already believing that you're not good enough, and then someone says, you're not good enough, and then they go cheat on you or something, that is going to amplify what you already believe about yourself, which is why it's important to work on a lot of this dysfunction before you get into a relationship so you can attract healthy people. And then when that person, whether they're healthy or not, says something hurtful to you, you have it in your psyche that they are coming from a place of pain and you are confident enough in yourself where you don't take it on as truth. It's a tough place to get to sometimes, but when you're in that place and somebody says something bad about you and and tries to make you feel bad, you can laugh it off. When you're really in that place, you can go, that's funny because I would have to believe you in order for that to be true and I don't believe it. And then they go, what? (laughs) They'll say, you're such an idiot. And you go, well, I, I guess that would hurt if it was true. And they would go, huh? Well, I know it's true. Well, I just don't believe you. And then they don't have anything to say. When you're in that place, when you're in that place of such self-esteem, such self-worth and such self-confidence, then people cannot project their own dysfunction onto you. It's still going to happen no matter how advanced you are. People are still going to say things that do hurt. And those are just little emotional triggers that you may not have dealt with yet or are just surprising because they're just so off the wall. But no matter what, you are worthy. And it just sometimes takes remembering that you're worthy before you started believing that you weren't. Anyway, back to your letter. You feel no desire because you keep getting beat down. Now, there are several ways to approach this, and you probably won't like one of them. (laughs) Here's the one you probably won't like. Give him what he wants and walk away from everything that he's attached to. Now, this completely unties any bonds that you have and frees you of his control in your life. That's probably advice that a lot of people can't or won't take. And I understand that completely because if I was in that situation, I would have to think twice about that too. I don't want her taking all this stuff. It's my stuff too. But it does help you free yourself of the control because someone who is pursuing and pursuing and pursuing and wants what they want, they will stop at nothing. They will spend all the money they can on the best legal counsel. They will keep pursuing until they wear you down. So there is the option of just letting it all go and starting fresh with that person not in your life anymore because that removes their control over your life, which is usually what they want. They want you to suffer. But if you let it all go, then you're not suffering by their hand. Again, you may not like that. It's probably not an option for you, but it is an option. One small example of that in my life is that I didn't want my first long time girlfriend that we broke up after 13 years. I didn't want her name on anything that we owned together. So I just bought her out of our mortgage and I said goodbye to her. I didn't want anything else connected with her. I wanted to move on with my life. Once her name was off, I was free of thinking about her at all. Yes, it hurt. No, I didn't want to break up, but I knew that the end was here no matter what, so I had to accept it. And I realized that the only way I'm going to move on from this without having to think about her all the time and then see her in a new relationship was to get her out of my life in every possible way. Fortunately, we didn't have kids. So we didn't have that connection that uh, some divorced parents have where they always have to see each other and coordinate with each other with kids. And I know that's very prevalent in the world. But Whatever you can do to disconnect or at least 
sign them off of whatever you can so that you can have some semblance of an individuality in your life again. That's something that if you can put in place so you're not connected in every little way. Unless you're friends. I mean, some divorced people are friends and you can do that. But in this type of situation, when one person is pursuing and pursuing and pursuing, try to take your name off of things that you don't need to share, you don't need to be connected by. And it frees you, frees you up. Little tiny steps. The more ties you have, the more you have to think about them. So do what you can. Can you let go of your ties? Now, I know this isn't always easy. Sometimes you don't have the money to buy someone's part of the mortgage or uh, something else out. Sometimes you just have to complete business. You just have to go forward in a business respect and try not to get your emotions involved. When you can do this from a business standpoint, from a reasonable, logical standpoint and look at the facts without getting your emotions involved, it's the best course of action. If there's any anger or sadness or hatred there while you're doing business, it really messes up the situation because then you're making decisions from a cloudy place. Then you're making decisions from a place of negativity and it's going to affect a lot more than just those business decisions going to affect your peace and happiness. So if you aren't attached to attachments, letting go is the best option to get them out of your life. You've worked hard and you deserve what you're owed and what you own, whether you got it yourself or together as a couple. So here's something else I recommend. Get someone to represent you and stop doing so much of the work yourself. It's too tiring and it's just too much stress on your system. If you don't have legal counsel, There's several ways to do it. And I've already mentioned this. I know this is going to sound like an ad, (laughs) but visit getoutofthemess.com and you have access to an attorney for 20 bucks. I don't even think it's 20. I think it's like 18 bucks, 18 bucks a month. That way, every piece of paper or threat that comes your way, you have protection and there's no reason you can't do this. 20 bucks a month could be a lot to someone who counts every penny, I realize, but it's the difference between an absolute nightmare of stress because you feel like you're trying to do all this alone or someone who's going to go to bat for you. Having legal representation of some sort helps so much alleviate the stress and the pain and a lot of the things that you have to take care of yourself while trying to live your life. Trying to fight this at the same time is just hard to do. And at the end of this segment, I'll give you a couple more resources just in case you really are so strapped that you can't afford that. But again, I highly recommend that. So let me say this. Thank God the deceiver was found out. You had a lot invested and that makes it so much harder. But let me tell you this. It's time to look out at the lost person you became from the space of the person that you want to be, if that makes sense. Because you want to figure out what you want for her. Become your own best friend and give her advice that you'd give a best friend. Now, maybe you have no advice. Maybe you have advice that you don't want to hear. (laughs) The advice I didn't want to hear when my wife asked for a divorce was to make it quick and make it stick. I didn't tell myself those exact words, but in a nutshell, I knew I was telling myself as my own best friend, the fastest way to healing my heart and fixing my wounds was to get a divorce and disconnect from her in any way I possibly could. This included getting my name or her name off of anything that we were connected to. Now, I know sometimes that's impossible, like I said, especially when they're kids, which is why you need someone to help you along the way. You know, statistically speaking, the marriage partner with the most money who also has a vindictive and vengeful heart tries to destroy the other one. And when you're on the losing end of that battle, remember that your ex knows what scares you, which is why he's treating you the way he is. But when you no longer have fear, he no longer has control. And this sometimes all boils down to a control thing. The vengeful partner wants to control and victimize the other person, whether they did anything wrong or not. I know someone whose ex-husband was a lying cheating, stealing person. And when she left him, he was offended and didn't understand why he couldn't have her and his other girlfriends too. So 
he hired the most diabolical attorney he could find and tried to destroy her in court. He had the money and she did all she could to fight him, but eventually ended up in bankruptcy. However, the only bright side of that is what ends up happening many, many times, as it did for this person too, is that courts know that the person with money is trying to overpower the person without it. So they usually see through what's happening. It's not always the case, but many judges know how disgruntled exes can use money and control to beat down their former partner. That's why it's important to have someone representing you. You know, I can't provide legal advice, but I do know that when you try to come up with a strategy of defending yourself while you're stressed and being attacked, you're not at your best. A cloudy mind makes cloudy decisions. And remember, if you want this relationship back, the last thing you really should want is to be with someone who intentionally deceives you and doesn't care enough about you to be the person that you deserve to have. That doesn't mean you're unwanted. It means he's incapable of loving you. People who really love us want us to be happy. They want us to thrive. People who love us are honest with us. They tell us things even when we don't want to hear it because we deserve the truth. I've told almost everyone I've ever been with, if you ever feel like cheating on me, at least leave me first. I'd rather have them leave me. It's hard to say something like that, but I'd rather be left so that there's no betrayal. In my first long-term relationship, that's almost exactly what happened. I don't think she was thinking of cheating on me, but I'm not sure. But after our breakup, she was married to someone else within months. Now, as painful as that was, I was grateful I didn't have to face betrayal in the relationship. That relationship contract doesn't apply when you split up, as painful as that can be. Now, at the same time, I'm wholly grateful that I am not with someone who wants to be with someone else. And this is vital and something that you need to take away. Be grateful that you're not with someone that wants to be with someone else. This betrayal is a blessing. Because if you hadn't found out, you'd still be with him. (laughs) And he'd probably still be with this other person. The hardest part to accept, at least during my divorce, is the idea that we're supposed to be with the one we marry for the rest of our lives. Now, this concept is a wonderful perception of the world. But you know, it takes two very strong, very supportive people to make that happen. Being married to someone, or even in just a strong, intimate relationship, means a lot of things. To me, it means that no matter what, I am there for you to support you and make sure that I'm doing what I can to show you that I care about your happiness. And the same works for the other person. When she is there for me, supporting me however she can, doing what she can to see that I'm happy, then it's a mutually beneficial reciprocative system of I give and you give and we both get our needs fulfilled. When both people are fulfilling the needs of the other, that to me is love and support. And when you have that, you don't have betrayal. If one of the highest values in the relationship is fulfilling the other person's needs and wanting their happiness, you don't betray them because you know that won't make them happy. It's actually a simple formula. I fulfill your needs, you fulfill mine, I want you to be happy, you want me to be happy, we are there for each other, and we're good. Now, you know the relationship is having problems when one or both of you isn't fulfilling the needs of the other anymore. It's not your job to fulfill their needs, but it is what comes with relationships. We can't kiss ourselves on the lips, so we have a need for someone else to kiss us on the lips. When our needs, wants, and desires are met by our partner, we don't seek fulfillment of those needs outside the relationship. That doesn't mean people won't still cheat because some people have more needs than you can fulfill. It's a matter of determining if you want to fulfill all those extra needs, which could be an impossible feat. Or maybe you shouldn't be with a person who desires more than you or anyone else could possibly give. 
Loving someone is wanting them to be happy and supporting their path. Now, hopefully their path is the same as yours and everything will work out. If not, then it's best just to be honest and talk about it rather than hide behind their back and betray them. Remember, you are desirable and lovable, but you're not a doormat. You are not a doormat. You don't deserve to be lied to or stepped on. So let me tell you what you need to focus on. Your situation is hard, I realize, but your motivation has been centered on how much he's beaten you. I mean like getting beat up, not like winning a contest. It's true, you were and are being beat up. This shows the character of the person doing it. Hopefully, you're over any thoughts of wanting him back in your life. And you're open to having anyone that fulfills your needs and you want to share time with. And if you're stuck on the fact that it has to be him, you'll never be happy, even if you get him back. I mean, I see this over and over again. When we attach all the best feelings that we can get in a relationship to a person, we deny ourselves what could be even better. And I want you to think of when you were at your happiest in any relationship that you've ever had and consider this. If you no longer had that person in your life, would you be open to someone else that made you feel equally as happy or even more happy? fulfilling more of your needs and desires? Would you be open to experiencing how you love to feel even more if it turned out to be someone else that was able to do that for you? Now, I don't ask these questions so that you can look for another relationship. I ask them to remind you that happiness isn't attached to a person. It's attached to how you feel with anyone that helps you experience those feelings. Sometimes we attach our happiness to a person, when in reality, we just love how we felt with that person. So, if you could feel the same way, if not even 10 times happier and fulfilled with someone else, would you consider someone else? Now, I don't know your situation. I don't know if you're thinking, oh, I want him back in my life. But I wanted to make sure I ran that by you just in case there was any inkling of thought of having him back in your life. You know, when you learn to let go that happiness isn't connected to a person, but is connected to how you feel no matter who it is, then happiness can begin again. You may not be in that space. You may not like him at all. <laughs> you may even hate him, and that's okay. You're allowed to feel and think these things. And when you can give yourself the liberty to express these feelings, these emotions, these thoughts, the healing can continue or begin. Now, on to another part of your letter. Remember what I said in a previous episode about momentum building momentum? Well, you mentioned that getting a low-wage job and starting over is the last thing you want to do. The problem with this line of thinking is that unless you have something, you might not get anything. So, I give the advice of get something so that you can start somewhere. One thing builds momentum to another thing, and that can lead you to unexpected places. Getting an $8 an hour job is actually something that sounds low and maybe even below you right now, but imagine what a $30 an hour employee can do in an $8 an hour position. Now, I don't know if you're a $30 an hour employee or a $100 an hour employee, but a $30 an hour employee will outgrow an $8 an hour position in no time. And you will have no choice but to rise in the ranks or find something else at another level. When you get a job that sounds fun, but it's at a terribly low wage, at least you'll have fun while climbing the ladder that you put in front of you. Now that really is the key. A job is better than no job so that you can start the momentum. No job is an excuse to stay home and be miserable. That doesn't mean you have to work if you're independently wealthy, <laughs> but a lot of people aren't. So you don't want to stay home and be miserable because owning that misery to prove to everyone, including yourself, that you were done wrong is unhealthy. Don't own that misery. Any job, even one that you don't really like, is a way to build momentum. And without momentum, 
you have stagnation. Stagnation builds more stagnation, and momentum builds momentum. The next choice you make compounds the last choice you made. If you like to eat cake every day, the next choice you make to eat cake will compound and add pounds to your body. If you're unhappy and you choose to stay as motionless as possible, you will compound your unhappiness. Eating cake leads to eating more cake. Just as eating something healthy, and I know some cakes can be healthy, (laughs) it leads to eating something else healthy. It's not an exact science, but it's a common occurrence. So just be aware of the decisions that you're making that are compounding the last decisions that you're making. The behavior that you're doing that is compounding the last behavior that you're doing. Momentum builds momentum. Stagnation builds stagnation. Now, you say you go to counseling. Fantastic. Here's my recommendation. Stop talking so much at your counselor. Stop talking and start emoting. Only talk about what you feel, not what you think. Always talk about how things affect you and never talk about what someone else is doing and why. Don't say, when he does this, I know it's just to get back at me for such and such. This is wasting time. Stay present about your emotions and how You're affected by people and your environment. You can say, when he does this, I get angry. I feel like I'm being rejected. I feel sad and that I'm not wanted. I feel hated or whatever comes up for you. Many people who go to counseling just talk and talk and talk. And I guarantee if you know your story so well that they're easy to tell to others and you aren't sharing what you need to share in order to heal. Share your pain. Share your shame. Share your embarrassments. Share everything you hate. Share that you feel like killing someone if that's how you feel. Share stuff that you'd tell no one else ever. Having an opportunity behind closed doors to reveal things that you're feeling is a chance that a lot of people don't get. You have a chance to share what's going on at the deepest part of you. Keep your talking focused on you and how you feel. Use I words like, I feel angry. I feel upset. Say the things that come to your mind, even if you don't really believe them. Say things even if you can't believe you actually had those thoughts. It doesn't mean you're going to act on anything or that you'll be forever forsaken for your thoughts. It just means that the pressure inside of you is being released. When you're in a cloudy, miserable place, pressure builds inside of you. You have lots of emotions going on and you think you have no way to get rid of them. And there's a few ways to express and release these emotions. And one trick is to write down everything you're feeling and write down everything you want to do to him. Even if it's not in your character, don't hold back when expressing. The mind and body store negative emotions inside the body. And outward expression by verbalizing and writing or other physical exercises are a way to get them out. Your negative thoughts have to turn into some sort of healthy outward expression. Otherwise, you stay miserable. You say you're experiencing depression. I can't diagnose you. However, I can only relate because I once had depression and I can definitely relate to everything you're saying. Depression is a lack of feeling emotions. It's losing desire and passion for almost everything in life. Now, one of the most important steps out of depression is expression. Let me share with you a direct path to depression, just so you get an idea of how you may have gotten there. First, You experience something you don't like, then you have a negative emotion and feel bad, suppress your thoughts, repress your negative emotions, keeping them tightly contained in your body, and then repeating those steps until depression manifests. Suppress your thoughts, 
repress your emotions, welcome depression. Or express your thoughts, express your emotions, deny depression. The problem is that many people choose to suppress their thoughts and repress their emotions because they believe it's a safer place to be. Suppression and repression compound and lead to more suppression and repression. What feels safe in the moment destroys the fabric of passion in the future. The first step out of depression is expression. The next step out of depression is this, altering your routine radically. For example, get up two hours earlier, take a cold shower, hike for 10 miles even though you can only do two, or do anything else that keeps you out of the same routine over and over again. Even taking a different route to work is an interruption to your pattern. Standing up at your desk every day is an interruption. What can you do differently? Now, last thing about depression. Find music that moves you. Find music that you have an emotional reaction to so that you can access those emotions in some way when nothing else seems to work. Music has that ability to connect us to our emotions, has the ability to connect us to happiness, to sadness, even when we're depressed. It just plows through and finds a way. And if you don't believe me, keep looking for that piece of music that you really connect to. Maybe find something that you used to listen to in your past. Find something that really moves you and you'll start accessing emotion again. Because once you access emotion, That's another way, another step out of depression because depression is the lack of emotion, that numb feeling. But when you connect to it, you're helping yourself find a way out. We're almost done with this letter, but there were so many points that um, Sandy brought up that I want to address. So there's a couple more things I want to address. Then we're going to take a break and I'll come back and just give you a quick wrap up. And I promise it'll only take like five minutes for that one. (laughs) Now, Sandy. You have a golden opportunity to start over here. I know, I know, you're not young, but damn it, you're not old either. My mom is 71. Her husband left her less than two years ago, and she had to learn to live alone. She started going to more yard sales and then started selling on eBay. She started to understand what life was like without a lazy, abusive drunkard (laughs) around all the time. It took her a couple months to realize that life is better when you're not with someone who brings you down. Sandy, life is better when you're not with the people that bring you down, even when you're dead broke. I quit a job and ended up in the poorhouse waiting in line every morning in a soup kitchen because I hated my job that much. And I was happy. I know divorce sucks and the aftermath is sometimes even worse. But how attached do you need to be to any of it? I realize the idea of living your life out with someone else is something you probably wanted. I wanted this too. But you can either accept that this happened and that you now have to deal with it the best way you can. Or you can choose to ask yourself, why is this happening to me? In one way, you'll stay the victim. In another way, full acceptance you'll become the caretaker you need to be for yourself. You know how to be compassionate to yourself, right? Here's an exercise I've mentioned before on this show. is this. Pretend that the wounded you is over there. And she's a little girl. And you watch her with loving eyes, knowing that she is a small version of you. She's vulnerable, innocent, and is learning about the world. Now, a white van pulls up and opens the side door. And two men are there, and they're talking to this little girl. And you can't hear what they're saying, but they're clearly motioning for her to get in the van. Her body movement indicates that she's about to get in. What do you do? Do you just watch the van door close and let it drive away? Or do you run over there and grab that little girl and save her life? This is how compassionate I want you to be towards yourself. 
you're allowed to be the victim, but you're also allowed to be compassionate towards that person in you that has experienced all this stuff. Be the person you need to be so that hurt little girl inside doesn't get manipulated. Yes, your ex may never want to quit trying to control you, and you may need to deal with these blows as they come. But there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And as long as you're willing to do what it takes to not be so attached to what was or what could be, and just be there for you at every turning point, you will end up in a more peaceful place. Now we're going to take a quick break here and I want to come back and give you some important steps that you or anyone else in your situation can choose to take or not. All right, we're back. And I want to mention a few things that Sandy can do or anyone else that's in this situation where they're going through maybe a messy divorce. They don't have legal counsel because they can't afford it or don't have the resources or the friends or the support that they need or that you need if you're going through it. And any or all of these can mean the difference between a challenging nightmare or just an unpleasant maybe manageable dream. I've already mentioned it, but I'm going to mention it again. Go to getoutofthemess.com and get yourself the legal representation you need. It sounds like an ad, but I don't care. This part is important, and I already know people that are using this service for the very problems that you're facing now. Now, here's another thing. If he's not paying you and he's supposed to, just go to the court and tell them. Go to court, even if you have to represent yourself, and just tell them He's not paying. If you were married long enough, you probably earned alimony and it's against the law for him not to pay. I know people who haven't paid and were smug about it and decided that the other person didn't deserve it. The law will decide in your favor. If they owe you money, they will either have to pay or go to jail probably. Another thing, look for a women's divorce support foundation. And if you're a guy, look for a men's divorce support foundation. You might even find that you can get donated legal counsel through them if you really can't afford anything else. The idea is to get someone on your side to help you and represent you. Another option is to check out visionsanew.org. That's the word visions and the word anew together. So it's V-I-S-I-O-N-S-A-N-E-W.org. They're a nonprofit divorce institute that help people just like you. Here's something else you need to know. Statistics show that men with money will drag out a divorce as long as possible because they know the woman will give up and walk away. <laughs> it's typically men. Sorry, guys. But men with money will wear women down until they just can't handle it anymore. So the woman quits. Now, guys... If you're someone like this, please do the right thing. Even if you hate her, just let her go and move on for everyone's happiness. It may feel satisfying, but so many people are getting hurt by your vortex of destruction. Just let it go and find an amicable solution. It's also really, really good karma. <laughs> and finally, Sandy, I only know one side of the story, but... Since you wrote to me, I have to rely on what you said. So because of that, I'm rooting for you to be there for you. Remember that wounded child inside needs that adult to stand up for her and protect her, even if it's just to help her express herself more deeply than she ever has before. You have people in your life that are there to help you, and you don't have to fight this battle alone. It's going to take some hard steps toward vulnerability in one sense because you really need to express some deep hurt and pain. And in another sense, you're going to need to access the strength that I know is inside of you so that you have it when you need it most. Thanks so much for writing, Sandy. I wish you the best.
All right, again, this was a departure from our regular format that we just changed. <laughs> but I had to do the departure today because there was so much to talk about uh, regarding divorce and a cheating spouse. And I hope that you got something from today's episode. Even if you're not a woman in the same situation, you could be a man in this situation. You could be anyone in this situation where your spouse has cheated or maybe they didn't or they wanted a divorce and maybe you didn't or the divorce came and no matter what you had to deal with it so during this episode you maybe got some pointers on what to do i want you to have a stress-free life and divorce is not usually conducive to that but i hope you got something from today and can take it with you no matter where you go for your relationships or your friends relationships and have a little bit of peace of mind that there are little exit strategies out of these highly stressful situations. That's the show for today. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. I thank everyone who has purchased a book or a worksheet, left a review, or used the Amazon link. You know, I wonder how many people listen to the end of this show. <laughs> and if you're listening now, well, have you ever listened beyond the end? Every now and then I leave a little Easter egg like I did in last week's episode. So those of you who listen to the end all the way to the end, sometimes will get a surprise. Not this time, <laughs> but sometimes I highly encourage you to listen all the way through. So there's a little secret between you and me if you're listening all the way to the end. Anyway, back to the closing. I love giving you everything I know every week. And I want to be there for you whenever I can. If you'd like to give back, just stop by the website and take a look. I make it easy to return the kindness. I also want to thank Legal Shield. They're a phenomenal service and have made our lives so much more peaceful. Head over to getoutofthemess.com, which is the special link I created so that you can remember the name, and get someone in your corner anytime you need them for less than $20 a month. That's getoutofthemess.com. You know, I am grateful for you. Whether you've been listening since day one or just tuned in for the first time and got a taste of the weird intro, <laughs> I'm so grateful you're here. And if you thought that intro was weird, eh, just listen to the backlog for some more surprises. You know, I really love the quote at the beginning of today's episode uh, from Wayne Dyer, where he says, conflict requires your participation or something like that. I don't have it in front of me. And the reason I love it is because it reminds us that we are responsible for our reactions, for our behavior, for our actions, even if someone else caused us to be in a situation we didn't want to be in. We're responsible when someone cuts us off in the road and we roll our car into a ditch. We're still responsible for our half of that equation. I know you might be thinking, well, they cut me off. I had no choice. When you give yourself no choice, when you believe that you actually have no choice whatsoever, you absolve yourself of power, you absolve yourself of responsibility, you absolve yourself of anything that allows you to be empowered. I guess I already said that. You absolve yourself of power, that means you absolve yourself of empowerment. And that's really what it comes down to. When you choose not to uh, own your responsibility and own your part of the equation, you give up your power. You don't want to do that. At least, even if you don't believe that you have any control when you get cut off the road or, or something else that just seems beyond your control, remember that you are still a part of it whether you want to be or not. And that means that you have some level of responsibility in how you respond, how you behave, even if someone comes along and pushes you down from behind. You have no idea it's coming. You're completely out of the loop in that situation, yet it's you that's falling. It's you that's catching yourself on the ground, 
on your hands or maybe you hit the ground so hard you hit your head and now you're bleeding. There's all kinds of things that is happening that you are in control of even though it feels like you're out of control. There's a metaphor here. Just remember that when you have some semblance of responsibility in any situation, even if it looks like you had nothing to do with it, then you still have power. You stay away from being a victim and you can actually see the silver lining on a cloudy day. So step into that power and be firm in your decisions and actions so that you can create the life you want. When you do this, you'll discover something I already know to be true about you, that you are amazing. <laughs>